إن الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على سيد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن ولا وبعض فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أيها الإخوة الكرام وأخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters, uh, respected uh, guests It is a tremendous honor uh, to be uh, back here in Melbourne again uh, we only wish that we could come here more often. And by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, perhaps we will be able to do that uh, because we've made an arrangement, alhamdulillah, that now I'm working uh, uh, for the Australian Islamic College in Sydney. And I think I'll probably be there uh, for maybe a year or two, which means we're almost like cousins. So uh, at the request uh, of the uh, organizers and uh, other Muslims in this city, uh, perhaps um, every couple of months or so we can come and we can do some work, uh, and not just lectures, but that we can do some work that is part of the building process uh, of uh, community work, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, regarding our subject tonight, um, I want to say to you that um, first, I always try to make these disclosures uh, because it is only fair and ethical to do so. Uh, I am uh, a student of a student of a student. So the people who are scholars and students of knowledge of the scholars in this city and other places, they will probably see the deficiency of what I have to offer, but I ask them to forgive me for that, inshallah, and you know, sort of also blame the brothers who invited me to come here. Uh, but what I will try to do, I'll do what uh, uh, the Bush doctor does. That is, uh, until he, the people can get to the clinics and to the hospitals and the places where they can get professional care, the Bush doctor, uh, he puts together little potents and things that, he can, that can help the people and relieve the people until they can get to the place where they can get the proper care. So uh, that's what I will do relative to this kind of subject here, because we already have, we have the Quran and we have the Sunnah and we have the Fiqh and we have the Tafsir and we have uh, the Seerah. And we have all the different Islamic disciplines. And the scholars have already written on this. The students have already spoke about this. It's been acted upon. So there's nothing new that I'm going to say. However, sometimes, at a particular time, under special circumstances, there is something that can be said. While the iron is hot, you can strike it. And then it makes a difference. What I'll try to do tonight is I'll try to sort of strike the iron while it's hot. Say a few things that from my background, uh, a guy from Brooklyn, you know, a new Muslim evolving into Islam, uh, striving to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe there's something that I might be able to say that gives a little new twist, a new insight, uh, a little something that you might want to think about and uh, take into consideration. That's the best that I'm going to be able to offer here, so I uh, ask for your patience. First, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to us in the Quran about the issue of unity, the issue of community, the issue of solidarity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already ordered us in this in the Quran. He told us, Audhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, wa'atasimu bi hablillahi jami'an wa la tifarraku. So the word, wa'atasimu, bind yourselves. Join yourselves. Bihablillah, the rope of Allah, the Quran and the Sunnah, Jami'ah. Jami'ah here means as a group, with a discipline, with a leader, in the manner in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered you. 
in the, by the example that you have seen in the Prophet and in the example of the companions and the tabi'een and the atba tabi'een. This is the jami'ah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. That is our paradigm. Wala and do not tafarraku. Do not be divided. Don't be divided by ideas. Don't be divided by personal things. Don't be divided by nationalities. Don't be divided by classes. Don't be divided by ethnicity. Don't be divided by culture. Don't be divided by anything. But be upon the Quran and the Sunnah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentioned to us in Surah Al-Saf. He said, Inna Allah yuhibbu ladhin yuqatilun fi sabidihi saffa ka'annahum bunyanam marsus. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves those who fight, who struggle, who sacrifice in his way. And the sabil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the tariq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sabil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the manhaj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The sabil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again the Quran and the sunnah. Safa, rose, discipline, as you are sitting, they set this hall up like this here to get the maximum amount of people in this room. Also, that they would be organized. They would not be falling over each other. They organized it. They designed it that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he organized, he designed this deen in the same way. Safa, ka'annahum, as if they were bunyanum, building, components, all put together. Marsus, marsus comes from the word ras. It means something which itself has been built Upon it poured something, maybe iron, maybe steel, maybe it's concrete in the middle, iron and steel poured over it, so that if you try to break it, it will not break apart. Marsus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is describing what he wants for the Muslim Ummah. Unfortunately, because of the times, because of our mentality, because of our disease, because of our condition, we have been broken, we have been scattered, we have been shattered, we have been splattered all over the world because we broke our unity. And we do not have a physical community. Neither do we have a global community, nor do we have a regional community, nor do we have a national community, nor do we have a municipal community. And in most houses, there is not even a family community. Unfortunately, why? Because there are some ingredients. If you don't have it, it can never come. You can have a Ferrari given to you, brand new, but if it has no steering wheel and no brake pedals, you're in for a crash. You're in for a nightmare. So Allah gave this to us, but unfortunately, no wheel, no steering wheel, no imam, no amir, no, 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 no imara, no government. So with no government, no khalifa, no discipline, no regulation, what can we do? Absolutely nothing. The Muslims are always talking about 1.6 billion Muslims, 1.5 billion Muslims, blah, blah. So what can you do with 1.6 billion wet matches? What can you do with 1.6 gallons of, of, of uh, stagnant water? What can you do with 1.6 billion pounds or tons of rotten food? Nothing. You have to recycle it to get something out of it. Today, the Muslims will have to be recycled. If you don't think so, you're just foolish and you're just naive. You're, you're part of those people that just keep reading books and you're in La La Land. <laughs> we Muslims have to have a head put on our body. We just don't think that something is wrong because we see the anatomy, we see ourselves. But the anatomy of the global nation has no head since 1924. No head on the body. And no Muslims with power or with knowledge have exerted themselves to put that head back on the body. We have resigned ourselves to be a Muslim body all over the world that everyone is looking at with no head on the body. Everybody got a head on the body. Everybody got a president. Everybody got a chairman. Everybody has a government. Even the perverts got a government. <laughs> Everybody has a head, a chairman, a power base, a government, a constitution, someone that leads them, someone that commands them, someone that represents them, except the Muslims. 
Yet we are the ones that in our book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us this. This is another subject. And I don't want those who, who uh, maybe some of you think maybe, maybe the brother been touched by the Hizb tahrir or something. <laughs> no, I'll tell you this. May Allah bless those brothers. For whatever faults they have, maybe he forgive them. But may Allah bless them for their aspirations, for their warnings, for their encouragement about this issue. Because if they're the only ones that's talking about it, they may be the only ones on the day of judgment that Allah is going to reward. And maybe he will pardon them for it. Forgive them for their faults or their shortcomings. Join them in what they say which is right and avoid what they say which is wrong. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the hand of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is over the jama'ah. This means the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is over the jama'ah. The guidance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is over the jama'ah. The blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is over the jama'ah. The preservation Allah will give to the jama'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the jama'ah because the jama'ah is the manhaj of the Prophet sallallahu Even if the Muslims became powerful, even if they became knowledgeable, whatever sophistication Allah gives them, when they have no jama'ah and they have no amir and there is no imara, there will be no blessing because it is a different kind of manhaj. You're following a manhaj of somebody else. It's not the manhaj of Islam. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whomsoever separates from the Jama'ah, one hand span, one hand span, separates themselves in, he in hell. Now this doesn't mean that whoever separates themselves from a group of Muslims at a mosque masjid, he joined that masjid, and then he separated from those guys, he had a beef with them, a problem with them, he separated and said, well, you're going to hell, Aki. That's not what it means. Whoever separates themselves from the Aqidah of the Jama'ah of the Quran and the Sunnah, separates themselves in hell. Why? Because they have separated themselves into a different group. The group of the of Dalal, the group of the Bid'ah, the group you understand me, of the Kufr, the group of the Fasad, the group of the Fasiqeen, the group you understand me, of the Munafiqeen, because they have to be of another group if they are not of the group of the Jama'ah and of the Quran and the Sunnah. One of our great Muslims, one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, His name was Umar ibn al-Khattab May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. He said in an athar, there is no Islam without jama'ah. Listen to it carefully. There is no Islam without jama'ah. No Islam without the presence of a disciplined community. The presence of a disciplined community. And no jama'ah unless there is an amir. And there is no disciplined community unless there is an amir. That is someone commanding them and someone whom the people have put their hands in his hands and they say, we will follow you, we will be loyal to you, and we will hear and we will obey in what we like and what we dislike in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, and there is no amir if he does not have amr. Amr, power, command, that is you and I. We put our physical, we put our mental, we put our spiritual hands in his hands, and therefore, when he lifts his hands and brings it down, he brings it down with the hands of 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 people, whichever it is in this city or any other city. If there is an Amir in the city of Melbourne who has the reasonable loyalty of the Muslims in this city, including their leaders, their scholars, their students of knowledge, their intellectual people, and their business people. When he lifts his hand, he brings it down. When he puts his hand as a contract in anybody else's hands, when he says no, when he says stop, when he says go, when he commands, sit, stand, move, he does so with the hand and the voice of every person in this city. Can you imagine what kind of power that is? It is power. So Umar ibn Khattab gave us a very practical understanding of jama'ah, the dynamic of jama'ah. No Islam. He didn't mean no salah. He didn't mean there's no zakah. He didn't mean there's no hajj. He didn't mean the people don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He meant that there will be no, uh, there will be no visible, tangible structure of Islam. No one will see it. No one will respect it. No one will respond to it. No one will believe it unless there is 
jama'a. And the jama'a itself will be undisciplined. It will be like a man who gets married and he says, I'd like to have 10 children, but he's sterile. He can wish, but if he's sterile, the only thing he can do is adopt some babies. <laughs> the jama'ah must have an emir. And the Prophet ﷺ said, ﷺ said, if there are three of you on a journey, what should you do? Choose one as the emir. One as the emir. This is just a journey. So we have a group of brothers. They do this all the time. All of you know the brothers. If they have to make sure for anything, to go to the store, go to this place, go to that place, they select three brothers. They go, they have, they have mashwara. They sit down, they choose an emir. This is a good sunnah. But it's a ritual sunnah. That sunnah should be practiced in our political, our social, our economic affairs. All the way across the board. Every Muslim in this here room right here and in the other rooms that's here should themselves know what Amir they have. You should know. If you don't know, something's wrong. Everybody know who their father is. Everybody know who their mother is. Everybody know where they work. Everybody know where they live. Everybody know their pin number. Why you don't know who's your Amir? You have to know who is your Amir. To you, for you to know it, you have to select. You have to nominate. This is a part of the Islamic manhaj. And we have to follow what Umar ibn Khattab said because the Prophet said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnatul khulafa al rashidin al mahdiyin. Upon you is the following of my sunnah and also the sunnah of whom? The khulafa al rashidin al mahdiyin. Who was one of those? Umar ibn Khattab. The literal meaning of community means group from the language, it means a group of people. Or for that matter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the terminology uh, even when it comes to birds, when it comes to ants, when it comes to animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the same terminology because they have been grouped with similar characteristics, with similar destiny. So human beings who are grouped together, whether geographically, soci so sociologically, uh, historically, ethnically, if they are grouped together with a similar destiny, that is called the jama'ah, literally in the language. However, through the Quran and the Sunnah, the word jama'ah, it took a broader and a deeper meaning to include a group of people who have a similar faith, a, fi a similar tradition, a similar inspiration, and also a similar legislation. We say, walahu al-hukmu, walahu al-amr, concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who, who, is, who is observing this amr and that, that ahkam is the jama'ah of the Muslims. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he used different words to express the jama'ah. He used the word ummah. He said in one place, Audhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you Muslims are the best of human beings evolved for the whole humanity. Why? Because you enjoin what is right, you forbid what is wrong, and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here enjoining the right doesn't mean encouraging people to do what's right. Amr bil ma'roof means having the power to, to enjoin the people to do what is right, having the power. I'll give you an, uh, an idea of Amr al Ma'roof or Nahir al Munkar. Coming from the airport, I saw, uh, I think we went to a toll booth. Isn't there one? Toll booth. You can't just run through the toll booth. You have to stop and you got to pay the money. Why? Because it's paid for the highway. And even if the highway is paid for, you're going to still keep paying. Because it's part of the system. It's part of the enjoining of the system. So they set up a mechanical thing that you react to automatically and you pay. This is because they have power. When the Muslims have power, the Muslims is also able to do the same thing in their areas, in their communities. They can stop the drugs. They can stop the, 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 the alcohol drinking. They can stop the people from gambling. They can stop the fornication. They can stop the adultery. They can stop the gangsterism. They can stop because they have power. And when we are unable to stop it, that means we have no power. 
And when our children and other people in our community see that we have no power, they roll over our faces. They do whatever they do right in our face. And even Muslims themselves, who themselves do not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they realize that the Muslims have no power, they also don't fear us. And they sell alcohol, and they sell drugs, and they, they, they sell uh, girly magazines, and they sell, they sell khamr, and they sell khanzir, and they do everything. And they come right to the mosque while their stores are still open. And they have no fear and no respect. And some of them, they're on the majlis. Some of them is on the board of trustees. Nobody can say nothing to them at all. They have no fear. Because in the time of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, when a man didn't fear Allah, they would fear Umar. <laughs> they would fear Khalid. They would fear people like uh, uh, Ubaidullah uh, ibn Jarrah. They would fear men whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave in them power. They would fear them if they didn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is part of the Amr bin Ma'roof. To enjoin the right means enjoin the people, encourage the people to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered. And in case the people don't have no fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they will fear the presence of those whom Allah has inspired. Nahir al-Munkar means forbidding what is wrong, stopping what is wrong, prosecuting the people that do wrong, making them pay for what they do which is wrong in this life. And that people can see people without hands. People can see in the public, heads rolling down the street. People can see in the public, you know what I'm saying, people got their head, hands, their hands and feet from opposite sides chopped off and they see them crucified. They see people get punished. They see people get put up against a pole and see them get lashed in the public. They see people get punished for slandering, backbiting, they see it. And because they see that, that acts as a deterrent for them because they think about that. They say, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. <laughs> I don't think that the people in Saudi Arabia, I don't think they fear Allah any more than you and I. But on more than one occasion, I myself left my wallet or I left my bag someplace in the public in Saudi Arabia. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I came back to that spot and my, my wallet is right there. Unbelievable. But it is not so unbelievable when you think about it. Because when I was in Riyadh one time, and I went to the central mosque on the day they had the Hajj, you see, then I could believe it. Because if you are seven years old, or nine years old, or 13 years old, whatever, and you see the execution take place for the man who stole something, that is, he picked up a wallet in the street that didn't belong to him. And then somebody said, Harami. And he was caught with that wallet in his hands as the evidence finished through. It only took three days for them to counsel him, prosecute him, and after that, set up on the Jumu'ah, the execution or the cutting of the hands. Quick, fast justice. If you saw that for yourselves, I think if you had seen my wallet sitting there, you would have probably just backed up. <laughs> Subhanallah. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he gives us you know, some of these different signs. But we are living in a society where everybody's thinking about their own profit. And if nobody can see nothing, mashallah, it's mine. <laughs> so the, the enjoining the right and the forbidding of the wrong, it is not abstract. It is not just we say, oh, brother, you shouldn't do that. We walk into a brother's store, you understand me? Brother, he got halal meat all in the back. He telling me about the, don't eat these chips, brother. Don't eat them crisp because they got red Z Z XZ on it or whatever the case might be. He got khamr across the whole wall. He got khinzir right in front of him. He got a whole rack of girly magazine for Wahish over there. And he got the lotto machine going. He got an extra people working over there on the lotto machine. And he telling me that he got halal meat and don't eat those crisps. <laughs> and the same Muslim will be in the first or second rank of the masjid in Ramadan praying behind the imam, praying the tarawih prayer, and he will be crying the most. The same man will be going to hajj, and on Arafat, he will be saying, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, wa mat'amuhu haram, wa mashrabahu haram, wa malbasahu haram, wa ghudhiya bil haram. How can his hajj be accepted, and how can his prayers be accepted? But this is our condition. We can do nothing to him because if we come in his shop and talk to him, he say, mind your business, get out of my store, I'll call the police. <laughs> because we have no power. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about the ummah, about the middler, about the jama'ah. And it took a formal and classical meaning. The formal and classical meaning that jama'ah took from the Quran, the community of the believers. The community of the Quran and the sunnah. And because of the comprehensive application of the Quran and the sunnah, the term al-jama'ah became a universal terminology for the entire Muslim world. That is, before the Quran, the word jama'ah did not have a universal meaning. After the Quran, after the sunnah, after Allah perfected this religion, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the paradigm of the Prophet sallam, and he gave us the paradigm of the, of the Islamic community, the Islamic government in Medina that moved out, then the world understood what is jama'ah. So the Prophet sallam, told us, if we want to know what is jama'ah, look to the three generations uh, the Jama'ah, he said, Qarni, thumma yalunahum, thumma yalunahum. Look to my generation, look to the generation of the Tabi'een, look to the generation of the Atba Tabi'een, and after that some other people came. And they did some things Allah told them not to do, and they refused to do some things which Allah told them to do. So the Jama'ah took upon a different meaning. It became a universal terminology for the whole Muslim world to see and for the whole non-Muslim world to see. From that perspective, the community already exists, which means we don't have to establish community in that sense. The community of the Quran, the community of the Sunnah, the community, Allah SWT already set that community in motion and that community will exist all the way until Yawm Al-Qiyamah from a theoretical point of view. However, the Islamic community does not exist within a theoretical vacuum. We cannot say there is jama'ah because we go to jama'ah. We cannot say there is jama'ah because we're going out to do tabligh work. We cannot say there is jama'ah just because a group of brothers got together to do something good. That is not the jama'ah that Allah is speaking about. The jama'ah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about is the jama'ah which itself covers all the comprehensive needs and has all the institutions that serve the interests and sets up the platform of Islam for the Muslims throughout the world. That is the jama'ah. We are a community with social, political, economic, and cultural dynamics. Islam is a self-contained global system. I repeat that. Islam is a self-contained global system. Self-contained means that it has everything in it that it needs to have in it in order for it to function. That's self-contained. No other, no other religion, no other faith in the world has inside of it the capabilities of ruling the world. Only Islam. And Islam has proven that. Second thing, no other system has the resilience that once it falls to the bottom, it can come back again. No other faith can do that, but Islam has done it over and over and over, and it will do that again. Islam is a global system. It is not a system of the Arabs. It's not a system of the non-Arabs. It's not a system for some area, some region. It's not a system for some particular time. It's a system for all time, all conditions, all space, all together, everywhere, for anyone and everyone, under all types of circumstances and conditions. The question is, what do we need to, what do, we need to do in order to build and sustain the Islamic community? Because that is our subject here. What do we need to do? to build and sustain the Islamic community as an institution and as a visible system. <clears throat> there are two phases that we can identify to do this. Two phases. One is called the building phase, and the other stage is sort of an organizational and executive stage. So let us go through some of the points that are necessary for the building stage. And brothers and sisters, listen, I'm drawing upon that which have been given. This is, didn't come out of my mind. One of our famous scholars, his name was, was Ibn Khaldun. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he bless him. He wrote a book, book, he wrote a book called Kitab al-Ibar. And the first book in the Kitab al-Ibar, which is about five books, is called Al-Muqaddima. This Al-Muqaddima is a very powerful book. I suggest that anyone interested in history, the sociology of Islam, understanding human beings, understanding the behavior of human beings, understanding Islamic systems and systems of the world and geography and sociology and those subjects, first read Ibn Khaldun. Read the, uh, read, read the, the Muqaddima and you will be able to understand some things. I'm drawing from some issues which he laid out there and I'm drawing on some other things. Number one. In order for us to have an institution and a visible system that would allow us to call it an Islamic community, not simply a Muslim community, but Islamic. They're two different things. A Muslim community is a group of Muslims, if they are weak, if they are deviant, if they are astray, if they are fasic, if they are of whatever caliber that they are, still they're Muslims. But that is not Islamic. And that's why we can't call the Muslim countries Islamic countries. I don't say that there's not an Islamic uh, uh, um, essence there. The flame is always there. The worst leader of the Muslims, still inside of him, there is something about Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has used the worst of the Muslims and the best of the Muslims to achieve his cause. We have seen that in the history. So we cannot say that Islam is not there. It is there. Wherever the Muslims are, there is some Islam there. But we got to bring the Islam out. Islam today is locked up in the prison of culture. And if we don't let it out, nobody will see Islam. They only see the Muslim culture. You and I, we have to let Islam out of the bottle of our culture. Take Islam out of the baggage of our culture. Take Islam out of the prison of culture. Islam is asking us, let me out. Let the people see me. And we won't let it out. Because we want to dress Islam in. We want Islam to be my lamb, her lamb, his lamb. They lamb. Us lamb. We lamb. They lamb. We want Islam to be everything other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it. Islam. We want to drape it, color it, decorate it, contain it, deliver it in our culture with our name, our ethnicity, our color, our dress, in our way. No. The Prophet Islam made it very clear. He said, Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa min Whosoever introduces into this affair of ours, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah and Islam, ma laysa min, that which is not from it, it will be rejected on the day of judgment, it will be rejected among the knowledgeable people, it will be rejected in this time, it will be rejected in the next time. Therefore, we Muslims, our culture is okay. Anything in our culture that does not disagree with Islam, it is okay. Islam didn't came to, run, to, to, to rub out the culture. Allah SWT gave us our names, gave us our culture, gave us our food, gave us our colors, gave us our different uh, forms and shapes and all of this. Allah gave that to us, but he gave that to us, he said, لِتَعَرَفُوا In order that we can just distinguish each other. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ those who have taqwa, those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are attached to the Quran and the Sunnah, those who put that first. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Ikhwa. The nature of the relationship between the believers is brotherhood. So in order for us to establish an Islamic community, we have to reverse the situation. We have to put the culture inside the prison of Islam. We had to put the culture inside the baggage of Islam. We had to put the culture inside the bottle of Islam. We have to contain our culture, our desires, our feelings, our ideas inside Islam. Now to do that, we have to start a process. Number one, there needs to be a group of Muslims who desire and agree. They must desire and they must agree to initiate the process. So there must be a group of Muslims who say, we have to have jama'ah. 
We have to stop this foolishness. We have to stop this division. We have to stop this backbiting. We have to stop all of this here things that we're doing. We have to stop this, this Adam stuff, this African stuff, this Asian stuff, this Turkish stuff, this European stuff, this America. We got to stop this. There don't need to be no masjids with no nationalistic, ethno ethnistic names, ethnocentric names. There ain't no Pakistani masjid. Ain't no Turkish masjid. Ain't no Somali masjid. Ain't no Saudi masjid. Ain't no Ifriqi masjid. Ain't no Indo-Pakistan masjid. No. In al masjid Allah. The masjids belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How dare you to put your name on the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because if it were allowed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would have allowed Ibrahim alayhi salam to put his name on that house. Then we would have been all making masjid. We would all been making salah at, at, the, at the Khalili masjid. We would making hajj at the Khalili masjid. The Ibrahimi masjid. Masjid al-Haram would have been called the Ibrahimi Masjid, the Khalili Masjid, because he is Khalil Allah, because he is Ibrahim, the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that is not the case. It is Baytullah. It is Masjid al-Haram. That is its identity. It is its characteristic. So why do people immigrate to a country? And because they want to they, they put their flag up, but the country ain't going to allow you to put your flag up. So what you do, you put up your little sign or you put your little thing in the telephone book. What you're really saying is, you're saying that this is a Turkish masjid, and therefore things go our way or the highway. <laughs> That's what you're saying. You're saying that the old heads, the seniors, the people who set this up, the people who put their money out, the people who's in the front, the imam in the mosque, so the, 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 the madhab that we follow is going to be that Turkish way. You, got, you didn't say that exactly, but that's what you mean. And if there's a Turkish masjid here, or a Somali masjid here, or a Sudani masjid, or an Arab masjid, or whatever kind of masjid, that's the deal. That is your madhab. That is really what you're saying. And if it's been here for 50 years, that's what it's been for 50 years. And if it's here another 50 years, that's what it's going to be for another 50 years. Until we change it. And it will be changed, inshallah. 50 years ago, 50 years ago, subhanAllah, at the, at the Masjid al-Haram, can you imagine this? When the Adhan was called, four Imams came out, and, 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 and one Imam went to the Hanafi station, the other Imam went to the Shafi'i station, the other Imam went to the Maliki station, and the other Imam, he went to the, uh, the, uh, the, the Shafi'i station, or the Hanbali station, and then, all the people of their followers came behind them and they made salah separately in the haram. SubhanAllah. And this was, this took place for maybe some 80 years. All the ulama, all the fuqaha, the kings and the princes and the, whoever they called themselves at that time, they allowed it. They couldn't do anything about it. Because whoever was the Amir, the Sultan, or whatever he might have called himself, who had, had the power, that's what he wanted. That's what he allowed. And the people, they loved it. Everybody loved it. Because when the Adhan was called, I go behind my Imam, that's it, it's me. We, we correct, we got our thing together. <laughs> we over here, we Hanafis, we, you know, we got our thing together. The Malikis, we over here like this here. And the other ones, they like this. The other ones, they like this. You know, we could all do our thing. Whatever we want to do, alhamdulillah, to make salat, we go, and we go eat. There wasn't no McDonald's uh, outside the haram then. So everybody can go eat their curry or get their shish kebab, and everybody could do what they want to do, and everything was okay. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent a man of power, a man of principle, and a man of knowledge, and wiped it out. Alhamdulillah, today, we all go to Mecca. How many imams lead the salat? MashaAllah. We don't say, we don't say how righteous the, the Saudi government is. We don't know Allahu A'lam. We don't say that it is because of their righteousness. But Alhamdulillah, as long as they have been there, the man who came out with the power, the man that came out with the knowledge, the man that came out with the principle, he helped also to establish that government. And that government has made sure there ain't no four imams. Alhamdulillah. 
We can see, therefore, what power and principle can do. Without power and without principle, you can have all the knowledge you want. People can do what they want, but when there is power, you can see. Because today, alhamdulillah, you can do whatever you want to do outside. But when you enter Saudi Arabia, everybody knows how everything goes. Everybody knows that. You can talk about them all you want. But whatever way they say it goes, it go that way or you get up out of there. That's power. At least I say we Muslims should have that kind of power all over the world. Because that is the only country right now, the only Muslim country right now, well, no, it, is, it, is, it isn't. Uh, it, is on, it is the only country that has the correct aqidah that is instituting the head. They're the only ones that have the, have the, 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 that have the power and who have the audacity and who have the principle to continue punishing the people as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say punish them. <coughs> now maybe they don't punish the princes and the kings and other them, I don't know. That's another issue. But the people that steal and get caught, the people that drink and get caught, the people that slander and get caught, the people that do fawahish and they get caught, the people that rob a bank or steal from somebody and they get caught, there is swift justice and everybody knows that. Alhamdulillah for that. At least there is a semblance of that in the world today. So first, the Muslims need to have a group of Muslims who desire and agree to initiate the process. Number two, they choose, they nominate or otherwise appoint one of them as the Amir. Now what is the Amir? The Amir is the person, it means he has He's a commander. Now, now, I don't understand. If a brother, some group of brothers come together here in Melbourne and they choose somebody, he ain't really the commander of Melbourne. That's not what it means. It means that they have accepted to appoint him with a responsibility of limited command. He is the commander of them. He is their prince. He is their representative. He is their coordinator. He is their imam, their president, their leader. Call him what you want, but when you put your hands in his hands and you say, brother, you need to represent us. You need to be the amir. What that basically means is you have abdicated or you have given up a portion of your power and given it to that particular brother. This is the way Islam works. And what it also means is that we, like other people, we are not democratic. So whoever talks about Islam is democratic, they don't understand. Democratic means like we all sit here together and we talk about something then we say we vote. So the majority what? De in democracy, de the majority wins, is that correct? So what could happen in a democracy is somebody could fix the vote. Somebody could set the whole situation up where in a democracy the majority of the people could vote what is wrong and they could even vote the Amir out, he gone. So whoever wants to follow democracy, democracy against the very principles of Islam. In Islam, there is no democracy, not in that sense. There is freedom, there is liberation, there's individual rights, there's the ownership of property, there is justice, all of that, there's consultation, but that is not what Islam says is democracy. What Islam says is that there is Amir, and the people should have shura, consultation, and if there's a disagreement among the people, after they talk and the Amir take their advice, for instance, if this brother here is the Amir, or that brother over there is the Amir, or whoever is the Amir, and all of us, we talk and he consult who we need to consult, and after he finishes consulting, he say, thank all of you very much. This is my decision. After the Amir makes a decision, nobody else can stand up and say, oh, we need to take a vote on that. No, we can do that here in Melbourne because the Amir doesn't have any power. But when the emir has power, no one will stand up and say, after he has made a judgment, we need to vote on that. I'll give you a good instance. We have this problem of when we're going to start the fast and when we're going to end the fast. Do y'all have that problem here? 
you know, the different, you got the different methabs, different groups. Somebody said they want to go up on a mountain and see it. Somebody said we don't want to be in the valley. Some people said, no, we're going to compute it. Some people said, no, we're going to go to the nautical people and they're going to look out at the sea. Some other people said, no, we don't already set it up. Some people said we already printed the calendar. That's that. I mean, everybody got all kinds of different things. So you wind up with five different dates for the beginning of, of, of Ramadan. How could that be right? And then when Ramadan ends, the same thing. Half the people is eating on the Eid. Somebody said, I'm following the, I'm following, I'm following the moon in, in Indonesia. Somebody said, no, I'm following the moon in Mecca. Somebody said, no, I'm following the moon I saw in the backyard. <laughs> and some people say, I don't care about the moon. I'm just counting 30 days. That's it. Well, let's look at the other side. Let's look at the other side. MashaAllah, in Saudi Arabia, there's a mufti. MashaAllah, our neighbor next to here in Malaysia, there is a mufti. In fact, there is 12 muftis in Malaysia. But there is a central mufti. When the mufti tells the president, when the mufti in Saudi Arabia tells the king, the moon has been sighted. The king makes a, 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 a verdict. A fatwa has been given. A verdict is made by the king. The execution of it, the announcement is fasting begins. Do you think that some people in some different cities or valleys or mountains of Saudi Arabia call up and say, oh, listen, king, listen, mufti, we ain't seen the moon yet, so we ain't fasting. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And I have known it to be the case where the mufti said that the fasting began on a certain day, that the moon had been seen based upon the dalil that they had captured. Ten days later, they did some investigation, and they found out that the person who gave them that information, there was some error. So then the mufti told the king. The king had everybody to write everything and said, add another day because we started wrong. MashaAllah. Consistent with what the Prophet Sallallahu said. But there was unity in the starting of it, and there was unity at the end. We have to have that. But if there's no power, no unity. So they must choose and nominate. Otherwise, appoint one of them the Amir, the coordinator, the chairman, imam, president, leader. Call them what you like, according to the Islamic manhaj. This group, then, becomes the founding body. They become the founding body or the core group that guarantees the Islamic constitutionality. And what is the co Islamic constitutionality? It is shura. That group guarantees, at least from a reasonable point of view, that there will be shura. There will be consultation. There will be leadership according to the manhaj of the Prophet Wasallam. It is called shara'i. It is called the shara'i method, meaning that it is shura according to the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. Therefore, the projects of that group, the programs of that group, the activities of that group, and the ambitions of that group will be, according to Quran and Sunnah, at least reasonably so. Why? Because they have come together for that purpose. This group, with the leader and this fundamental structure, they begin to invite, attract, and promote this good endeavor they begin to promote it, call people to it. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever calls the people to that which is good will receive the good that comes from it and, the one, and uh, uh, equal to the one who does it all the way until the day of judgment. And the one who calls the world evil will get the recompense just like the one who does it all the way until the day of judgment and there will be no dim diminishing of it. So they call the people to this good. They promote this good. They attract people to this good. So this group begins to build the area where they reside, it begins to be populated. They start to occupy that area. They start to buy the houses. They start to buy the land. They start to open up stores. They start to set up their institutions, their businesses, whatever. Their activity, their name, their influence is known in that area. And again, not because of any ethnicity. So there ain't no Arab town. There ain't no African town. There's no Asian town. If anything, they might call it Muslim town. Once they secure assistance and support from the other Muslims, they begin to establish committees.
to organize various services, and to develop different resources. Now, one of the unique aspects of the Islamic community is that it is not founded or inspired by ethnic, nationalistic, political, special interests, or personal ambitions. This is very important, brothers and sisters, because we have seen in the world today, there are many Muslims whose countries have been unlawfully, illegally, criminally occupied. At least there's 14 Muslim countries today that have been occupied. There may be another 10 or 15 that is occupied by Muslims through the non-Muslims. That means non-Muslims are still manipulating Muslim countries through Muslim puppets. Another 14 or 15 countries have been directly occupied. People have been dispersed. And some of those people right here, some of you sitting right here are the products of that dispersion. And that is because the criminal activities of the unbelievers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he promised this would continue on us. But also, what has happened is that in those countries, there are resistance groups. Every country where the Muslims have been dispersed, a resistance group comes up. Unfortunately, because of lack of guidance, unfortunately because of lack of knowledge, unfortunately because of lack of leadership, that resistance group usually winds up having, being built upon liberating the country. And the Prophet Sallallahu already said that whoever raises their voice for nationalism, for tribalism, or any other kind of ism, this is a, this is a call of jahiliya. So therefore, how can the liberation group for Palestine, the liberation group for Kashmir, the liberation group for any place, how can that group be successful if the call that they are calling is not La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nothing other than that because they don't have to liberate Palestine, and they don't have to liberate Lebanon, and they don't have to liberate Kashmir, they don't have to liberate Afghanistan, they don't have to liberate that, why? Because the grandfather of the Prophet وسلم, who wasn't even a Muslim, he understood that when something belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't have to liberate it, because when Abraha came to Mecca to destroy the Kaaba, what did the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ do? Did he gather some people together to liberate or to defend it? No. He told Abraha, listen, this house, it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This house has a lord. This house has a owner. So this house, the owner of that house will defend it. But for me, I have some goats and some sheep that belong to me, and I'm going to take them up in the mountains. <laughs> And all we have to do then, and we go to the story of Allah subhanahu wa says, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fil. Alam yaj'al lahum, alam, alam, alam yaj'al lahu kaydahum fi tadlil. Allah gives us the story. What was the, what was the effect of those people? But we don't believe it. If the Muslims in Palestine, and may Allah bless all those and give all those the rewards for what they have done and what they will do. And we are not the judge of them. But if the Muslims of Palestine, if the amount of Muslims in Palestine who pray the Jum'ah prayer at Aqsa, at Masjid al-Aqsa, if the amount of people that pray Salatul Jum'ah at Masjid al-Aqsa, if they were also praying the Fajr and the Isha prayer at Masjid al-Aqsa, the matter would have been finished. And this goes true for all the Muslims. Because our call has got to be La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Our call and our liberation has got to be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only for the deen of Allah, only to raise the name of Allah, to establish the Quran, to establish the sunnah, and for this deen, and only for this deen. Otherwise, Allah will continue to humiliate us and frustrate us and disgrace us at the hands and feet of our enemies. The Islamic community is the one that is established and sustained to promote, cultivate, and entrench the message and the tradition of the Quran and the Sunnah. Wherever Muslims reside, we already have the power. There's enough Muslims in this room. I didn't say in the whole Melbourne. I said there's enough Muslims in this room that if they stood for the Quran and for the Sunnah, SubhanAllah, in a, in a matter of two or three years, your whole condition would change. 
the Muslims in this room, the men that's in this room, if these men in this room, if all of you committed yourselves to pray the Fajr in Jama'ah and pray the Isha prayer in Jama'ah, and if you put your hands in the hands of some Amir, you'll find in a couple of years, your condition would change. But maybe you don't want to make that commitment. Maybe you think you got the inside track. You, got, you know enough Arabiya. You know enough tafsir. You, you, you know enough Aqidah. You went to the university of this and that. Yo, who, who, who this guy talking to you? What do you know about? You think you know. You think that you're enough Muslim. You think you ain't got to do that. You think there's something different today than it is yesterday. You don't think you have to make the Fajr prayer. You think you can make it as long as you're praying five times a day anywhere and everywhere. You think you can make it like that. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said different. He said, you will know the munafiqun from my ummah because they have a problem in making the Fajr and the Isha prayers in Jama'ah. That puts the verdict on a lot of us sitting here. See, a lot of Muslims, they won't talk about jihad. They won't talk about khilafah. They won't talk about the Islamic State. They won't talk fiqh. They won't talk aqidah. They won't talk about ilm. They won't talk about the haq. They want to talk, 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 talk. They want to point, 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 point. They want to blame, blame, blame. They want to criticize. They want to say those people is, those people is kutubi. Those people over there, there is uh, 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 Mubtadi. Uh, those people over there is Khadiji. Those people over there is Sufi. Those are Salafi. Those are Wahhabi. Talk, 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 talk. I say, if we want to talk, meet me at the Fajr. <laughs> if we want to plan, let's plan after the Fajr prayer. Let's plan after the, uh, after the Isha prayer. Let's meet, let's talk before and after Fajr and Isha, behind the Imam. And then let's discuss what our relative Amirs, from wherever we came from, what area, what my Amir said to me. Let's try to get our Amirs together. Let's work like that. All the different groups that's represented here, let's get our Imams together. Let's get the Amirs that we set up, our chairmen, our leaders, let's get them together and ask them what's the deal? What's happening? What's the problem? Why you guys can't get together? Why you guys can't get together and choose whoever knows the most Quran, whoever knows the most of the Sunnah, whichever of you is the oldest among you? Why can't you guys get together and do that? What's the problem? If we don't ask them to do that, they won't do it for another 50 years. Oh, Muslims. Inevitably, the first challenge and responsibility of this community is to establish the worship and to establish the place where the worship al ibadah is taught, performed, and preserved. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ did when he entered Medina, when he entered Medina, the first thing he did, the first task, the first challenge that the Prophet ﷺ settled was the issue of the establishment of the mosque. Not getting his own self a house. Not getting a little hall where they can have their little, play their little domino in their cars and smoke their little ergol or hubbly bubbly or whatever. <laughs> that wasn't what he did. The first thing he did was the establishment of the mosque. And from what I understand from the seerah, there were two young boys that had some land which they owned and they offered it to the Prophet Sallallahu free. They said, oh, Messenger of Allah, so some take this land from us. He said, no, I will only take it if I pay for it. So the Messenger of Allah, so some, he paid for it. And with his own hands and with the help of those people, they built the masjid. And the Messenger of Allah, so some, he accepted from the believers a room off of that masjid for himself and for his family. This was the first mosque, the first town hall, the first majlis. The first place of congregation, the first senate of the Muslims, the first government of the Muslims, not just a mosque, the first university of the Muslims. So the first thing we need to do is, once we break down all these different divisions and all that there, we need to come together and build a great big mosque in Melbourne. A mosque at least the size of this building right here. I mean, top and bottom, two, th two three floors. The same amount of space that the brothers have, same amount of space the sisters got to have. A big mosque. If there are 80,000 Muslims in Melbourne, I don't know what the number is, you got to build a masjid that holds at least 20,000. 
that become the central mosque. That's the Jami mosque. So during the week, everybody pray at the little local mosque. But you get together and all the imams and all the leaders and all the guys that got the names and all that there, you get them to agree that on Juma, shut those little mosques down and go to the Jami mosque. Then you see the power of the Muslims. You see the respect of the non-Muslims. Then that mosque is the place where we will be able to put the Islamic University. We'll put the Islamic College. We'll put the Islamic Senate. We'll put the Islamic Town Hall. Then we don't have to rent this kind of hall no more. See, you can have this kind of gathering like this here every week because it'll be your place. Why can't we do that? You got enough money in this room right here, right here, to do that. In this room. We just had to lock all the doors and put some great big guys there, but don't let nobody out. <laughs> As a matter of fact, listen, before we leave here tonight, we're going to talk about that. The community is the town hall, the senate, the masjid, the majlis, the congregation place, around and behind the leadership. This is the place of their worship, their education, their planning, their to conduct and administrate their affairs. It's the place where they conspire. Yeah, I say they conspire. We got a right to conspire. Everybody conspiring against us. We got a right to conspire, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only allows us to conspire for the good. He says, He said, and conspire together, join together, cooperate together, promote together. For what? Birr and taqwa. But don't join together, cooperate together, conspire together for ithm, sin, udwan, and corruption. From this masjid, majlis, they develop and cultivate their faith, they assess their resources, they plan their future, and they fortify their source of guidance. This concept is one of the cultural dynamics of the Islamic community. To sustain this effort, there is another set of principles necessary because that is only the building process. The next process is called the executive principles. One, they must be committed to the discipline of hearing and obeying. Sama'a wa ta'a. In the collection of Imam Nawawi, the ahadith collection, the Arba'in ahadith of Imam Nawawi, uh, rahmatullah he mentions a hadith there. That, that is a, it's a long hadith. He mentions the hadith uh, upon you is the obligation of following my, my sunnah and the sunnah of Khulaf al Rashidin, Addu Alayh bin Nawajid. He goes on and he says, and to hear and to obey, even if a leader is chosen from among you who is from the black Habashi slave who got a head like a raisin. Now you think about that now. Think about it at that time. The very last thing that the Arabs of that time was ever thinking about was that a Habashi slave somehow became their leader and to make sure the Prophet Sallallahu gave the description of him that he had a head like a raisin. That means that in their eyesight, he was not a handsome person. In their eyesight, he was dark, black, ashy, wrinkled up. <laughs> The Arabs never in their thought of their minds, they never ever thought in their minds they would ever have to follow a man like that. So the Prophet gave, gave them the furthest, most remote example. MashaAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he produced a leader of the Muslims like that. His, his name was Bilal ibn Rabah. MashaAllah, he became the governor of Syria, of Damascus. His grave is there in Damascus today. And they called him Master Bilal. These are the whitest Arabs you're going to find. But they called him Master Bilal. Sayyidina Bilal. Radiallahu an. How the Prophet ﷺ made this prediction. Do you think that some people from Sham ever thought in their minds they would be following a black man who would be the ulama, the sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ living with them? It happened. So the Prophet ﷺ gave us this example so that you and I, when we think about a person who we don't like, somebody who we don't want to follow, you know, the, 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 the Arabs, they don't like the Pakistanis. And the Pakistanis, they don't like the Arabs. You know, and the, and the Africans don't like nobody. <laughs> 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 
No, I don't mean that. I don't mean that, brother. <laughs> I, I could have switched it around. You know, I switch it around sometimes. <laughs> no, the, the issue here, brothers and sisters, honestly, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so that we have to hear and obey because it may be that someone who we don't like the way they look, we don't like where he came from. You know, he don't say ain. He don't say, well, he ain't got the dad together. <laughs> well, why Allah choose him? That's what the Yahudi said. That's what the Bani Israel said about, about, uh, about what is it, the, the king's name, with Talut. He said, why he chose him? We better in stature, we stronger than him, we look better than him, we richer than him, why Allah not choose him? Because that was the choice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made. Our responsibility as Muslims is to prepare ourselves to hear and to obey. So when the, when the iqamah is called inside the mosque and we line up, the imam says, astawu safu sufufukum, wa tarasu i'tadilu. The imam is commanding you, telling you, line up, straighten the rows, shoulder to shoulder. The imam is telling you that and you got no choice about it. But that's only in the mosque. After the imam says, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum to everybody's gone. If the imam says, sit down, people say, who are you? <laughs> the khatib on Jum'ah, the khatib, you understand me, on Eid, you saw it. The imam on the Eid, you know, after the, the Eid is switched up, on Jum'ah we pray first. I mean, in the Jum'ah we, and on the Jum'ah we talk first, and then we pray last. On the Eid, we do it just the reverse. We pray first, and after that we're supposed to talk. The, Imam, the, the Muslims, after the, after, the, after the prayer is over, the, after the Imam do all the tight beers and all that, finish, he get up to talk, the Muslims break, breaking out. They starting to barbecue, the kids running all around, the brothers are talking, everybody got on new clothes, the sisters walking all around, and the Imam, he talking, can't nobody hear him. Because the Muslims don't have no respect. If the Khatib of the Muslims had respect, he would tell everybody, everyone sit down. And they would be sitting just like this and he could deliver to those 4,000, those 5,000 people as he's supposed to, but he cannot. Because the people ain't hearing and they're not obeying. O oh, Muslims, this will produce the effect of regulation and accountability among them. If we have no accountability and no regulation amongst us, it's a free for all. It's every man for himself. It's just a little thing that we set up. You know, this is the brother, the Amir. This brother's the president, he's the chairman. Whatever it is, we just set it up like that there so people think we got a little organization together. But in reality, ain't nothing happening. We're fooling each other. This is nifaq. This is deceit. This is deception. We must establish the basic services. They must harness the basic resources. It is the duty of the Majlis Ashura. It is the duty of the people who, who are the people, the custodians of the mosque, the custodians of the Islamic community. It is your duty to produce services for the community. If you cannot produce a service, then get out the seat. Go sit home and let somebody else sit in that seat. Whether you are the Amir, you are the Imam, or whatever. If you don't have the time, if you don't have the energy, if you don't have the ability, the commitment to serve the people and give the people what they need, you need to give up that spot and let somebody else come there and do that. I don't care who you are. Don't matter who you are. You could be, you could be a graduate of the University of the Kaaba. <laughs> if there is such a thing. You could be the mufti of all muftis. If you are unable to serve the people because you don't really have no time, you don't have the commitment, you need to move out of that spot Maybe you should serve the people in a different capacity because this Islam needs workers. There's another athar that I remember. It says, and uh, some, uh, it may be just a part of some poem. The Arabs will know it. It says, Men Sayyid al Nas, Men Khadim al Nas, Sayyiduhum. Whoever serves the people is their Sayyid, he is their Amir. The Amir is the man. First one to wake up, last one to go to bed. He's the man that cleans, washes, regulates, watches, monitors, 
He's the mover, the shaker. He's the man that would, he, he listened to the ideas. He's sacrificing for the people. He got the feeling for the people. He cries for the people. He works for the people. And they see him like that all the time. That's the kind of Amir that we need. We don't need no people with no big hats, big heads, <laughs> big names, big thobes, big bellies. <laughs> We don't need them kind of people. Because the companions of the Prophet they was not like that. I don't know why, but as I'm reading the seerah, I did not find many of the companions of the Prophet like that. <laughs> Even the Messenger of Allah وسلم, did you know that after he was 40 years old, he fought all those battles after the age of 40. And did you know that he fought in at least 17 major battles after he was over the age of 50? That means he was carrying on his body 14 kilos of armor where the sun was like 36 degrees Celsius. Up and down mountains riding on a horse, riding on a camel, riding on a donkey, and then fighting in the battles. How could he have done that if he was like that? <laughs> no, the Prophet Sam wasn't eating a whole lot of whole lot of whatever it is that we eat. The companions of the Prophet Sam, they was lean, tough, hard men. And most of them who were fighting, they already was over 40, 45, and 50 years old. I ask you this, what can the 45, 50 year old men in this room do? <laughs> if I told you to run back home and come back here, you couldn't do it. In Mecca, we were standing in Mecca one day MashaAllah, the Saudis had won the, uh, the, uh, they had won the finals for the, the, the World Cup or something. They didn't win the World Cup. They just got to the finals. You know what the World Cup. You guys know what it is. And so they was all running, all the young guys were all running through the streets and everything. Like they had fought the war, beat the Yahudis and everybody. <laughs> they were blowing horns and waving the Saudi flag and in the back of their cars. I thought, man, man maybe, they had just, maybe they just took Jerusalem back. <laughs> I said, what are they doing? They, they, they won the finals of the, of the World Cup. Some football. So you got the young boys kicking the ball through the streets and the old men sitting up on the side of the road with the ball in their bellies. <laughs> so then what can young boys kicking a ball and the men who swallowed the ball, what can they do? Now, it's not really a joke. It is sad. It is tragic that we don't have young men who have the spirit of jihad or vigilance or defense or consciousness or discipline because they playing games. And we don't have old men to govern those and guide those. We don't have the old men to govern and guide and to be the examples for those people. You got the separation there. And so what I meant by that, I'm giving an analogy, really, that we have two separate groups that itself we need to change. The Muslims must establish the basic services that they must harness the basic resources. Basic resources of the community means human resources and material resources. Let's get, understand this. Human resources means, Allah subhanahu wa says, wa tujahiduna fi sabilillah bi amwalikum wa anfusikum. Is that what he said? Be amwalikum wa anfusikum. Amwal means money, property. Anfusikum, your energy, your talents. That's what we need. If the Muslims want to achieve something, you got to do the same thing the Jews do. Same thing the Christians do. The same thing the Buddhists do. Same thing the Hindus do. Same thing the Ahmadiyyas do. Same thing the Baha'is do. The same thing everybody does. You got to come with your people, your skills. You got to come with your money and your property. Bring it together. If you don't want to do that, you are going nowhere. <coughs> Kafirs will be kicking dust in your face the rest of your life 
and the rest of your children's lives until you make up your mind to bring your property and your money and your person and your skills and bring them together and make them available to the Jama'ah. The Muslims must make the correct assessment of their environment. We must think, think, cut off the TV, cut off the radio, take that MP3 out of your ear. <laughs> think about your situation. Allah subhanahu wa says, in the fi khalq samawati wal ard, واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات أولى الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقودا وعلى جنوبهم يتفكرون في, يتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض يتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض they are thinking about the creation of the heavens and the earth they are thinking about their condition they are thinking about their society they are thinking about their nation they are thinking about the world we have to think make the right assessment of our condition. We cannot just be reading the Quran as it just is a mushaf. It is not just a mushaf. The Quran is a dynamic set of principles. We cannot be reading the Sunnah just memorizing hadith and talking about principles of aqidah and blah, blah, blah. No. What about the society? Who is controlling the society? Who is controlling our resources? Who is building the roads? Who controls the communications? Who controls the food, the irrigation? Who controls the agriculture? Who controls the power? Who controls the water? Who controls the land? We have to think about that. Because when we make the correct assessment of our environment, and we develop a spirit of competitiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, فَاسْتَبِقُ الْخَيْرَاتِ Fastabiqul khairat, the word fastabiqu comes from the verb sabaqa, to swim, to compete, to try to be better than the other in goodness. Fastabiqul khairat, compete, strive with each other for what? Khair. Allah wants us to be competitive, competitive against the kuffar, even when he wants us to be competitive. Nothing wrong for the Muslims to have contests. Who will be the best? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he is the one in Tabarak al-Ladhi bi-yadhi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir al-Ladhi khalaq al-mawt wal-hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala to see which one of us would be the best in our contact and our, our conduct. The Muslims have to strive and have a develop a spirit of competitiveness. Muslims have to be vigilant. Vigilant. Muslims have to be vigilant. That means your eyes open, your ears open, listening, watching, checking. What's going on? The Muslim is not the one that somebody sneaks up on him and robs his dignity. The Muslim is not the one that somebody sneak up on his family and rob their virginity. The Muslim is not the one that somebody sneak up on him and plot on him and all the while he's sleeping and chilling. No, the Muslim is vigilant, watching, checking. Even he's watching and checking his women how a man allows his wife to go out the house with perfume. How he allows his wife to go out without her hijab. How he let his wife to go out be just mixing with men. How the man just allow his wife to do that? The Prophet ﷺ gave a name for that man. What's, it, what's that name? The youth. The youth. This is the man he does not, he don't mind his wife shaking hands with men. He don't mind his wife sitting down next to the men being chummy with them. He don't mind leaving his wife in halwa with another man. He don't mind his wife leaving the house with lipstick and perfume on and all that in the door. He already saw her do that when she got up. She putting on mascara, she doing all that. How the man let his wife leave like that? He is the youth. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the man that is the youth, Allah won't even look at him on a day of judgment. He won't even look at you. Because you let your prized possession, your wives and your, 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 wives and your daughters, you let them go like that. The Muslim have to be vigilant. He must guard himself, he must guard his family, he must guard his society, he must guard his community. Wherever the Muslims is at, it's supposed to be a place that people want to live. 
The non-Muslims should want to live in the Muslim community because there's no drugs, there's no alcohol, and no fitna, ain't no loud music playing, ain't no crazy dope boys running around. They're not, they, 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 their property is safe. Their person is safe. The value of the properties in the Muslim community goes up. Everybody want to live there because the Muslims patrol that area. That's what happened in Medina. When the Muslims came to Medina, everybody wanted to be there. The, the, the Jews didn't want to move out. After they conspired, the Prophet said, put them out. The Christians didn't want to move out. The ones that didn't accept Islam didn't want to move out. They stayed, and when it was time, they paid the jizya. And this would happen all over the Muslim world. People wanted to stay with the Muslims because to be with the Muslims is to be prosperous. To be with the Muslims is to be safe. To be with the Muslims is to move with progress. To be with the Muslims, there was justice. So Muslims are the people who are competitive, vigilant. And finally, the Muslims have empowerment. Muslims strive for empowerment. We want to buy up all the houses in the neighborhood. When the churches ain't nobody going to the church, we buy the church too. When the bars go out, of, the pubs go out of business, we buy the pubs, turn them into schools. Muslims look for every property that comes up for sale and we buy it in our neighborhood. And we got the money. We don't need fancy cars, we need to buy the property. Call another Muslim to come live there until in that area, the Muslims own everything. The Muslims cannot be isolationists. That means you can't just be righteous people living over in a corner someplace. You can't say to all the society, them as Kafirs, those as Munafiks, those as Muqtadi, brother, those are deviants over there, and we the only righteous people and we over here because you will not be able to feed yourself just because you're righteous. You will not be able to deal with the services that you need because you're righteous. I always ask brothers who are always criticizing other people. This one is wrong, that one is wrong, them Kafirs, man, so and so, them, so and so, blah, blah. I ask them, I keep listen, when you were sick, what hospital do you go to? <laughs> do, you go, you, do you go to the, 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 the righteous hospital? The ones who's guided? What, what kind of doctor your, your wife go to when she's pregnant? She got to go to that prenatal examination. When the guy got to put that, that glove on all the way up to his elbow. What doctor do you go to? Is, is that doctor, you understand me, what meth have do he got? What guidance does that doctor have? What grocery store you go to? What farm you go to? What school do your children go to? Do you pay taxes? Is your landlord a righteous person also? Because these are the services that control us. I say the Muslims need to get control of the services and stop pointing at each other. Take control first. After you take control, then we can start talking about our house. We get our house together. First take control first. Then we can start cleaning up the house. Muslims must be prepared to teach and preach their religion. Teach and preach their message while integrating and interacting. I say we should teach and preach, but we must also interact and integrate. Yes, the Prophet Wasallam, he brought the teaching and the preaching to Medina, didn't he? But he also interacted and integrated. The first rule the Prophet Wasallam established, the first principle the Prophet Wasallam established was a simple one. He said to the Muslims when they arrived in Medina, he said, Give food. Look how beautiful that is. Imagine some people just arriving, and when they arrive, they just start giving out food. That's what the Red Cross do. That's what the Catholic Relief Society does. That's what all these, these uh, missionaries are doing in the Muslim countries. They are arriving with train loads, boat loads, plane loads of food and medicine because they know that they will be greeted. So he said, Tut'imu ta'am wa takra'u salam man arafta wa man lam ta'rif. Give food, distribute food, and also take the invitation. And also give the good greeting and return the good greeting to whom you know and whom you don't know. This is the social principle of Islam. Also, 
The Muslims must learn to interact with the other community. Learn to interact with the intellectuals. Learn to interact with the politicians. Learn to interact with the businessmen. I didn't say be like them. I didn't say live next to them. I didn't say chill with them and drink with them and eat. I didn't say that. I said interact with them. Do business with them. People who are politicians make deals with them. The Prophet saw him, he did it. He made treaties. Read the seerah of the Prophet saw him. The seerah of the Prophet saw him and during the Medinee period is full of treaties. What is those treaties? Those are deals. The Prophet saw him struck deals, agreements between the non-Muslims and the Muslims, the Jews and the Christians, between the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims, and the people who was the desert Arabs, the pagans. He made deals with them, with the kings, with the princes and rulers in different places. He made deals with them. We can make deals also. Also, not only did he make deals with them, but the Prophet saw saying he borrowed money from them. You know the story of when a Jew came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, came to Medina, came to the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a Yahudi, came to the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and stood up over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Oh Muhammad, give me my money. Grabbing his clothing, give me my money. And the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood up to kill him. They wanted to kill him. How can a Yahudi come in the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grabbing his clothes like that, talking like that? To kill him. No, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Don't do that. This man has a haq over me. He has a duty, a right over me. Is there any one of you who can help me to pay off this debt? So Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu an, he said, Oh, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have some palm trees in the far end of Medina. I would give it to him. That Yahudi, he said, No, I came to see if you were, in fact, a prophet. Because if you were a prophet, you would honor this debt. And if you are not the prophet, you would abuse me. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we see the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's interacting. How he's borrowing money from a Yahudi. He's doing business with them. We can do business. We can interact. But we hold our aqidah and we hold our integrity and we hold on to our Islam and we maintain the leverage of our power base. The Muslims must be conscious and focused upon creating and sustaining institutions. Education, commercial, social, services, communication, dawah, administrative, services, institutions. They should be all around where the Muslims are, institutions. Otherwise, they will be subordinate to the Kafir institutions and the Kafirs will make them dysfunctional and the Kafirs will make them sterile in the society. That's the choice we have, either build our own or to be subordinate to somebody else. Number six, they must be committed and dynamic in the work of da'wah. They must develop a new profound platform of da'wah. Now what does that mean? That means that if there are four, five hundred, six hundred people here in this room and other rooms here today, then when we make a call for da'wah, we go to our neighbors, we go to our colleagues, we go to our co-workers, we go to our family if we are new Muslims, and we tell them something dynamic. You got to come, you got to hear. I've been talking to you, I've been dealing with you, I've been pleading with you, you got to come and hear this, because I can't explain it. And you bring them out. 600 Muslims that do that and try to do that for the next 90 days, 600 Muslims will bring 200 non-Muslims. And my experience is that if 200 non-Muslims come in a room like this and they see that clear bottle of water of Islam, whatever they thought about Islam, they will get to see it that night. They will hear it, they will see it, they will understand it, and I will tell you what the results usually are. My experience is that usually out of every 100 people that come to a lecture, a non-Muslims that come to a lecture, 10 or 12 accept Islam just like that. Just like that. Because this is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yahdi man yasha wa yudhillu man yasha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fa'alu lima yuri. He's the doer of whatever he pleases. And the hearts of the people is between the fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a person, he comes out, he comes to hear, he sees, it's clear for him. He says, oh, I understand. Oh, I like that. Oh, I want that. And I have seen it so many times over and over and over. And just to give you an idea of that, 
I have witnessed myself. I have seen myself just in the last two years. I have seen over 3,000 shahadas in, in situations just like this. 3,000 in just the last couple of years. 10,000 in the last seven years. Our neighbors, our coworkers, our people that we work with and deal with uh, every single day, the ones we go to school with every day, some of them want to be Muslim, but they don't understand it because of the Muslims themselves. Sometimes we got to move the Muslims out the way for people to see Islam. <laughs> and I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that if you do this work of dawah in this city, you do it unselfishly. It don't have to be no dynamic brother. Don't, you don't have to get no dynamic brother to come here and do no dawah. The dawah is dynamic enough by itself. The water is clear. If you put this here next to a dirty bottle, the people will accept this one all the time. It's just that the Muslims are in the way. Most of the time when people say, I don't like Islam, they're really talking about Muslims. Move the Muslims out the way and let the people see Islam. And you're going to see, mashallah, something happening in front of you. People will start coming into Islam so fast, you're going, you won't even have teachers for them. The problem, I think, with some of the Muslims is that you don't want these other people to become Muslim because you think they might move you out the way. <laughs> but that's the way Allah works. If that's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway. You might as well join what's going to happen. Oh, Muslims, they must be aware of the world. You must be aware of the society. Do not live in a bubble. Understand the fiqh waqia. Ask the students of knowledge. Ask the scholars. Look around yourselves. Go to the internet. Ask questions of scholars who know. Ask Muslim scientists, Muslim doctors. Ask Muslim educators. Ask Muslim businessmen what is going on in business. Ask them what's going on in politics, in government, in the society, in the world. Ask them so you know. Because the Muslims have to develop something called contemporary and relative fiqh. I didn't say we changed the fiqh. There's no change in the fiqh. But the fiqh itself has got to address the contemporary and relative situations. We don't have a static fiqh in Islam. The fiqh is there. The fiqh is there to facilitate. The Quran and the Sunnah is static. It doesn't move. It's perfect. But the fiqh, the understanding, it is moving. It is dynamic for every time and every place, for all people, for all conditions, and our fiqh our scholars, our students of knowledge, they have to address the contemporary situations. Then we will see that people are going to respect Islam because they will see that the Quran and the Sunnah addresses all the situations. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you so much. Uh, and I want to finally say to you that the Muslims must be connected to the scholars and the students of knowledge who have the correct aqidah and the, 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 the dalil which is presented by, uh, to us by our pious predecessors. That means every Muslim. You can't be trying to follow Islam and look into Islam and learn Islam, and you ain't connected to no scholars, you ain't connected to no students of knowledge. How do you think the knowledge is going to come to you? If you want to plug, you're going to get some power for your computer or for your television, you got to plug it in the wall. You can't just go buy some new t television or buy yourself a new computer and you don't even plug it in the wall. You can't have a car and you don't pull up next to the petrol pump and put some gas in there. How are you going to get knowledge? You're not near the scholars. You don't have the books of the scholars. You're not next to the students of knowledge. How are you going to get knowledge? You think you're going to go to the bookstore and buy some books? You're crazy. You're confused. The best thing you're going to get buying a whole lot of books and bringing it inside your house is a whole lot of confusion. The knowledge does not come by the books. The knowledge comes through the scholars. It comes through the scholars into the students of knowledge. If you want to be something, you want to get the knowledge, become a student of a student of a student, at least. Make sure that you authenticate your knowledge and that you are upon the correct aqidah. Because if you have no correct connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's all batil. It's all useless. It doesn't mean nothing. Make sure your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is correct. And make sure that your knowledge is correct. Make sure that you are upon the Quran and upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You should build constructive and healthy relationships with the leaders and intellectuals of the other society. I said, we don't, have a, have a, we don't always have to have an adversarial relationship with the non-Muslims. 
Why Muslims always talking about the Kafirs? You don't have to be calling people Kafirs. Yet they are non-Muslims. But why you got to always, the Kafirs this and the Kafirs that? When nine of the 10 things that you need in life came from the Kafirs. When you came in this country, I want to remind most of you who want to stay here in this Kafir country, you got the Kafir stamp on your passport. You got the Kafir money in your pocket. You got the Kafir picture on that money. And you probably got a Kafir landlord. So why you keep talking about the Kafirs? Develop a healthy relationship with the non-Muslims. I don't say we join them. I don't say we imitate them. I don't say we love them. They don't love us. They don't join us. They don't follow us. But we have to develop a healthy relationship so that we can get the most out of the worst situation. Because the Prophet وسلم, he taught us that. He said, Wa ahsinu inna Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when a greeting is given to you, follow it up with one that is what? Equal or better. The Muslims must engage in tawasaw and tawasaw and ta'awan with themselves. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa tawasaw bi sabri, wa tawasaw bil haq, wa tawasaw bil haqqi, wa tawasaw bi sabr in Surah Al-Asr. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa tawasaw bi sabri, wa tawasaw bil marhama. The Muslims have to forgive. The Muslims have to forgive and let go. The Muslims have to pardon each other. The Muslims have to cooperate with each other. The Muslims have to become brothers and sisters to each other. The Muslims have to support each other. You're going to have to do this and put that pill away. Whatever it is you're holding for that other Muslim, you know, that enmity, that envy, that jealousy, whatever it is you're holding against that Muslim group or person, put it away. I don't say follow the deviant people. I didn't say that. No, we don't follow the deviant people. But we adopt the relationship with the Muslim to get the best from that Muslim. Because a Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. Even if he is astray or even if he's a sinner, he is still a Muslim. We do not call a Muslim that commits sins a kafir. A Muslim never becomes a kafir until they become a murtad. If they make ridda, they say ridda, they, they make a ridda of iman. They say, I'm no longer a Muslim and they make kufr, then they become kafir. But a Muslim does not become a kafir because of their deviance, and they don't become a kafir because of their sin. So Muslims have to be careful, because one day the person who you call a kafir because of the weak situation they're in, five years from now you may find out that you're in a situation, and you would not want somebody to call you whatever you call them. And we know the issue of the qadr. Think about the hadith about the Qadr. Nobody knows what their Qadr is going to be. So be careful when you call somebody a Kafir. That name or that accusation goes up into the heavens and comes back down on the one who is really a Kafir. We leave it for the ulama and the fuqaha, the judges of the Muslims, those who make qada, the ones who make the assessments. We leave it for them to make that determination and not us. We treat every Muslim as a Muslim. If they are a sinner, we punish them for their sins, if we, are, if we are able, if we have the authority. If they are sinners and we know they're committing a sin or they're deviants, we point out the deviance to them. We enjoy the right, we forbid the, wrong, forbid the wrong, we advise, we do everything that we can. But a Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. And I say we should put brotherhood first and put the differences after that. Wallahu a'lam. O Muslims, the Prophet Sallallahu said we should think positive. We should think, think positive and speak good about the Muslims and their condition. He says, let him who believes in Allah on the last day either say what's good or what? Or keep quiet. If you don't have something good to say about another Muslim, man, keep quiet. Just shut up. Close your mouth. Bite your tongue. Zip your lips, whatever you want to call it. You don't have something good to say, keep quiet. We don't need to hear it. The Prophet وسلم, gave us this kind of adab. He told them, Min husnul Islam al-Mar'i, tarkahu ma la yani. 
it's part of being a good Muslim to leave alone that which is none of your business. That means if, you know, if a Muslim is doing something, you ain't got nothing to do with that. Mind your business. Why are you all in my business? Why are you all in somebody else's business? Why are you talking about everybody else? You don't have a house, you got some children, you don't need to tie your shoes, you don't pull up your socks, you don't need to clean your house up, your backyard, you don't need to deal with your own children, your own situation. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? Speak good, promote good. If you hear about a Muslim that you disagree with and somebody asks you about that person, say, MashaAllah, I like that brother or I like that sister. He's a good brother, inshallah. May Allah forgive his sins, inshallah, and forgive my sins also. Finish. Why, why is it difficult to say that? You ain't lost nothing. You ain't say, I love the brother, and I agree with what they do, and I'm, I'm on the same Aqidah. You didn't say that. You're just pardoning and overlooking the faults because this is the manner of Islam and it helps us to come out, brings ourselves closer together. Dear brothers and sisters, um, I thank you very much for your patience and your tolerance uh, for hearing me to address this issue. I hope that something that I said was of some benefit to you, inshallah.